If you've been following along, then you know we've started the study on the mysteries. Last time we talked about the mystery of godliness. And if you'll learn these mysteries, it'll give you a firm foundation on doctrine. The mysteries are like your doctrine safety net. And we're going to be looking at the mystery of Christ in you. Now, I think that mystery of godliness, that's the most important mystery. If it wasn't for the mystery of godliness, then none of the other mysteries would even matter. The mystery of godliness was about the fact that God was manifest in the flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh. And if Jesus Christ is not God manifest in the flesh, then all this that we're even talking about is pointless. Because if Jesus was not God manifest in the flesh, then he didn't resurrect. And you wouldn't resurrect. But this next one is the mystery of Christ in you. Well, I believe the mystery of godliness was the most important one. I believe learning this one could be the most helpful one. The mystery of Christ in you. Colossians 1, 26 through 27. It says, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So there you have it, the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now what makes this a mystery? Well, the first thing that makes this a mystery is how could a holy God dwell in a sinful man like you and like me? I'm going to give you the reasons how and why a holy God could dwell in a sinful man like me and you. And the first place I want you to go is Romans chapter 4. And you know Romans chapter 4 is about Abraham and how he got imputed righteousness. And so what happened was the moment you got saved, you traded out your unrighteousness. You gave your unrighteousness to the Lord and the Lord gave you his righteousness. Y'all traded. And it says in Romans 4, 3 through 8, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now Abraham believed God about his seed. You believed God about him dying on the cross for your sins and paying your sin debt, and you put your trust in that to save you. And when you believe that, he counted it to you for righteousness. And it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Meaning if you could do good works to get saved, then, then what you've got was of debt and not of grace. If you did so good that you earned it, then God was indebted to you. But he's not indebted to you. He gave it to you of grace. It says, but to him that worketh not. See, if you did no works at all, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's about your faith. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. When you got saved, God imputed righteousness to you without you doing any works of any kind. And if that's imputation. He took righteousness and put it on your record. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So not only does the Lord impute righteousness to you, but after you get saved, he won't impute sin to you anymore. Do you see that? You get imputed righteousness, and then you don't even get sin imputed to you anymore after you get the righteousness. So you... It's possible for you, it's possible for God to dwell in you 
because you traded out your unrighteousness for his righteousness. Jesus Christ left the riches of heaven and he came down to die on the cross for your sins. He came down and lived a sinless life, fulfilled the law perfectly, fulfilled all righteousness so that he could die on the cross and offer that righteousness to you and y'all traded. So when God sees me, he doesn't see all these bad things that I've done. He sees the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine you've got a folder with your name on it, and God can open that folder, and he saw every evil thing that you ever did and will do. And it's got your name written all over it. Well, what happened when you got saved was he took that folder tore the pages out of it, threw it behind his back. They vanished forever. And then he took a copy of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and put that in your folder. Now, when he goes and grabs your folder, got your name on it, he opens it. And inside, all he sees is Jesus Christ. All he sees is the record of Jesus Christ. He doesn't see the bad stuff you did. And to take it even further, he doesn't even see all the good stuff that you did. When it comes to your salvation, he doesn't, see, he doesn't see the bad stuff, and he doesn't even see the good stuff. Like it doesn't say, uh, so-and-so is saved because they did this, and because they did that, and because they didn't do that. When he opens it, it says, so-and-so is saved, and here's the righteousness of Jesus Christ on their record. See, it's not the even the good stuff you did after you got saved. It's not making you any more saved than you were to begin with. You are no more saved right now than you were the moment you believed the gospel. You are no more unsaved right now than the moment you received the gospel. So when God looks at your record, he sees Jesus Christ. It's like spiritual identity theft, but God is okay with it. You, t you took the Lord's identity. Now when he sees you, he sees Jesus Christ. It says in Romans 3, 21 through 22, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. See that? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It's not about the law no more. The law was about their own righteousness. Now it's about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. See, the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ. You see, you couldn't help that you were born... You couldn't help that you were born a sinner. So God gives you a, a choice to believe on Jesus Christ and he'll give you a new birth. You couldn't help being born the first time. You couldn't help being born a sinner the first time. But now you got this option to be born again. And it, when you get born again, he gives you an uneven trade. He will take your sins nail them to the cross, and then in exchange for your sins, he'll give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now your spiritual identity has the righteousness of Jesus Christ on it and not your own. And here is an example of your old record. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So at one time, on your record, it said, thief 
covetous, drunkard, reviler, extortioner. You got saved? He washed it. Your record has been washed, and it's got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on it. So how could a holy God dwell in sinful men? They trade out their unrighteousness for his righteousness. And next they get a transfusion of blood. You ever heard of a blood transfusion? It says in Romans or in Revelation 1 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Your sins got washed away in the blood when you got saved. And this is special blood. Acts 20:28 20, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. That shows you this blood is God's blood because Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. Remember, it's the mystery of godliness. And Colossians 1, 14, in whom ye in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. You see, God used his own blood to purchase me. And I'm not even worth shooting. But God bought me for a high price. And I, God can dwell in me because of a blood transfusion. I started out with the sinful blood of Adam. And I, in my flesh, it's still got that sinful blood of Adam. But my soul's been washed by the blood of Jesus. And that's why God can dwell in me. And then the next thing. So he, you traded out your unrighteousness for his righteousness. You had a transfusion of blood. The next thing, you took off the body of sin. In Colossians 2, 11 through 13, it says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That made without hands, that shows you it's not a physical circumcision. This is a spiritual circumcision. It's made without hands. Now look at this. Look what this circumcision did. In putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You put off the body of the sins of the flesh. The Lord took off your body of the sins of the flesh. Buried with them in baptism, and that's not water baptism, that's a spiritual baptism. Remember, we're on spiritual things right here. Wherein also ye are risen with them through the faith of the operation of God. You see, it's an operation. God performed an operation on you. The faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. See, when you were dead in your sins, you had the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see, the moment you got saved, the moment you believed the gospel, he cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now when you sin in the flesh, those sins of the flesh no longer can contaminate the soul. They're not touching anymore. And that is why God can dwell in you. Your sins in the flesh don't touch the Lord. Now your soul is separated from your flesh. You see, before you were saved in the uncircumcision of your flesh, every time you sinned, it got on the soul. And if you died with that sin on your soul, you'd have went to hell. But see, now, after you've been saved, your soul's cut loose from your flesh. Now, when you sin in the flesh, your soul's already been washed in the blood of Jesus, so it's perfect, it's clean, it's got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on it. And when you sin in the flesh, it's not contaminating the soul anymore. So now, that's why you get to go to heaven. That's why you're saved. Your soul's been washed in the blood of Jesus, and even the sins that you committed after you get, after you get saved, they don't even go on the soul because it's been separated from the flesh. Nothing can contaminate the soul. And this is why God can dwell in you. You took off the body of the sins of the flesh. So now your soul... 
and your flesh have been separated. And I love the illustration that Paul gives in Romans chapter 7. You know, in Romans chapter 7, he's using the illustration of a, of a married woman and her husband. It says in Romans 7, 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband, so this woman, she's not divorced, she currently hath an husband, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. So as long as her husband is alive, she's bound to him. She needs to, she's supposed to stay married to him. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. See, you see, if he dies, she doesn't have to be bound to him anymore. She's free to marry another. So if he dies, she's loose from the law of her husband. But verse, verse 3 says, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So if her husband's still alive and she goes and gets somebody else, she's an adulteress. But if her husband be dead... She is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. So if her husband dies, she goes and gets another husband. She's not an adulteress. She's free to marry whom she will, only in the Lord. And that's the illustration. Look at what he says in Romans 7, 4. He's going to show you what he's trying to say. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So you see, when you got saved and put into the body of Christ, you became dead to the law. Your flesh is dead in the eyes of God, so that you are free to marry another. You see, you, at one time before you were saved, your flesh and your soul was stuck together, they hadn't been loosed. They hadn't been separated. They hadn't been divorced. But then the moment you got saved, the flesh died. And your soul was separated from your flesh. And now your soul was free to marry another. Your flesh died, causing your soul to be able to marry another. Just like a woman her husband dies, she's then free to marry somebody else. So now the flesh is your ex. Just like you got an ex-girlfriend, an ex-boyfriend, the flesh is your ex. Your soul separated from it, and you're free to marry Jesus Christ. That's why we're the bride. And now the flesh is your ex, and it won't leave you alone. It's calling you every day. It's there as soon as you wake up. It's got you a text message waiting on you. It's wanting you back. It's kind of like when you was married to somebody and divorced for whatever reason. And then you're always kind of tied to your old spouse in some way. Especially, you know, if you had kids with them. And it's just, it's bothering you every day. Your ex is bothering you every day. Every day you wake up and you got to remind the flesh that it's over between you and him. And you got a new man, the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to reckon your flesh to be dead and not serve a dead corpse. You need to tell your flesh that it's over between you and him. And there's a new man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So your soul was cut loose from your flesh. That's why God can dwell in you. So, why is this a mystery? It's a mystery because how could a holy God dwell in sinful men? Well, you traded out your unrighteousness for his righteousness. You had a transfusion of blood, and you took off the body of sin. The Lord took it off with that spiritual circumcision. And it's a mystery because Jesus Christ dwells in me, Jesus Christ dwells in you, Jesus Christ dwells in you, and Jesus Christ dwells in this guy over here, Jesus Christ dwells in that guy over there. How could he dwell in everybody? Is there millions of gods? No, there's one God, but God can dwell in you 
and God could dwell in me, and God can get, dwell in that guy over there. You see, it's a mystery. All right, the next thing. How could God dwell in sinful man? We just explained that. Now look at this. You are the housing for the Holy Ghost. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? No, you don't you know that? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You're the temple. Don't defile yourself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? You got Christ in you, the hope of glory, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. He bought you. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, if you didn't have the option to not glorify God in your body, then Paul wouldn't have said that. And you see, it's a mystery because look at Second Chronicles 2, 6. It says, but who is able to build him a house, seeing the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build him a house? save only to burn sacrifice before him. If the heaven and heaven of heavens can't contain him, if the first heaven where the birds fly can't contain him, and the second heaven where the moon and stars are can't contain him, and the third heaven can't contain him, then how is my body going to contain God? It's a mystery. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost. He lives in you, and you need to make him feel at home in there. You see, you're probably not making him feel at home in your house, but your body is the housing of the Holy Ghost now. And putting the Word of God in you is like decorating and furnishing the house for Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if you're not furnishing, if you're not reading the Word of God, you're not furnishing his house. You're having him, he's sitting on the floor in there. You just got him sitting on the floor. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, when you get the scripture, that's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and righteousness, and you're putting that in you constantly, it's like you're throughly furnishing the housing you got for the Holy Ghost. You're throughly furnishing it. You're getting furniture in every room. You're getting a couch over here, a love seat over here. You got him a desk over here where he can read at. You got him a kitchen table over here. You got him a, a dining room table over here. You got him a king-size bed over here. But you see, most Christians have their temples so full of the world's junk that the, does, the Lord does well to have a pull-out couch. A lot of Christians have their house, their body, looking so bad that it looks like a house in a drug neighborhood. And then you look in there and the Lord might have a little light bulb and he's sitting on the floor in there. But you need to have it thoroughly furnished. And you see a lot of Christians go to what they call church every Sunday. And they think that the building is the house of God. They think that's the house of God. No, they are the house of God. And see, if you'll get this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Then you're going to realize some things. In Acts 7, 48, it says, How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. See, he's not dwelling in these buildings. It's Christ in you. You are the housing of God. And if Christians would realize that, then they wouldn't turn into someone else when they enter a church building. They would be the same everywhere. They wouldn't become this big spiritual giant when they enter this building on Sunday 
and then when they leave it turn back into their normal self they'd be the same everywhere and the way some uh, preachers talk it's as if when they enter church they enter the presence of god but that's not true god goes where you go you go to church he's with you you go to a strip club he's with you you go to a bar he's there with you it's christ in you and you are always in church. You always need to act right. You always need to say things right. You see, realizing that it's Christ in you will keep you going the right places, reading the right things, talking right, and doing right. You won't become this other person on Sunday morning when you go to a building You'll be the same person Monday when you go to a work building. You see, you will be a lot less of a hypocrite if you realize it's Christ in you, the hope of glory, and you take God everywhere you go. See, you're the housing for the Holy Ghost. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you've got this treasure in earthen vessels. In 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10, it says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's your body. It's an earthen vessel. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. You see, you want to uh, let the light of the Lord Jesus Christ that's in you shine out of this earthen vessel. You want people to see the treasure shining out of your earthen vessel. You see, one day the Lord will break the vessel and the treasure is going to come out and your body is going to be changed. And throughout your Christian life, the Lord will allow humbling experiences and things like that to take place in your life so that that treasure that's in you can shine through the cracks. You see, sometimes if life's going so good, then uh, you won't be living so good and there won't be any cracks in this earthen vessel for the treasure to shine through. It says in Colossians 3, 8 through 10, he says, but now... Ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So you need to put off the old man, put off this flesh, so that the treasure can shine. And the Holy Spirit works through you like the unclean spirit works through a lost man. You see, when you're saved, you, you had the spirit of disobedience shining through. And see, the, the lost, you're the housing of the Holy Ghost. The lost man is the housing for the unclean spirit. Just like in Matthew 12, 43 through 45, it says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, be it also unto this wicked generation. Notice he called it a house. He saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. The lost man's body is the temple of the unclean spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You need to remember that. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And now the next thing, it's hope for the day of redemption. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, you got tightly secured salvation. It's a tightly secured salvation. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. It's like, it's like God took that lid on a, on a jar. Your salvation's inside. He securely tightened it. Tightly secured it. And the devil can't even open it. 
It says in 2 Corinthians 1.22, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. He gave you the earnest of the Spirit. He sealed you by the Holy Spirit. He sealed you. And that's the earnest of the Spirit. Like earnest money when you buy a house. Earnest money shows that you're serious about buying the house. Remember, you're the house of the Holy Ghost. And he put the earnest of the Spirit in you to show he's serious about this house that he's got, that he's buying, that he's bought. And that one day, he's going to buy the, the whole thing. It's going to be redeemed. Your body's going to be redeemed. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Ye are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is the earnest of like the earnest money. Your soul's already saved. You're already in heaven with the Lord, spiritually speaking. You're just waiting on your body to be. You're waiting on the body to be changed. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is so sure that you can have complete assurance of salvation. You have a tightly secured salvation. And if you keep the teaching of Christ in you, then you can run on facts and not on feelings. If you run on feelings, you might feel saved today, and you might feel lost tomorrow. The old man is about feelings. The new man is about the facts. He sees all these facts that I'm laying out before you, and he says, I know I'm saved because of these facts. The flesh gets up and says, I don't know if I'm saved or not because I did this, and I did that, and I did this sin, I did that sin. But the new man's like, I'm saved, I'm sealed, it's a tightly secured salvation. And next, it's a taste of what is to come. Just like the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The What's in you is a taste of what's to come. You see, your outside's bad. Your flesh is vile. Your flesh is nasty. But on the inside, that's a foretaste of glory divine. It's a taste of what's to come. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Our soul's saved. It's been redeemed. Now we're waiting on the body to be redeemed. It's going to be redeemed at the rapture. We're going to get a new body. God's going to break this one. The treasure's going to shine forth our body's going to be changed. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that, this is the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And this mystery has to do with Jesus Christ lives in you. And he's been living in you since the moment you got saved.